Pastor Bill Evans, Jetland Fellowship Baptist Church, uh, welcoming you to, as you tune in to, uh, we've got some messages that uh, Marlon and Chet TV have been encouraging pastors and we're glad for the opportunity to share uh, of Jesus and his love from the Word of God and, and uh, they got messages and we're putting together some Lent messages for the Easter season. So uh, I have one I'm going to share this, this today on that message and so we welcome you to listen in and uh, trust that your heart will be blessed as we do. Um, we, uh, uh, the, my message about this is that for our message, I want us to consider Lent, which is the season of uh, things that are, we, people put away and stop doing uh, through the season in celebration. But um, uh, I want us to go back to, uh, the, uh, the back to the start of the critical work of the Easter story, when things were really starting to come to uh, uh, the, the crescendo of the, the, the trial and the crucifixion and all those things. Where did it start? And uh, it's interesting because in 1 Corinthians chapter 11, we just about always use that as part of our communion service. And that's Paul talking, and he, says, and he says, I received from the Lord that which I delivered to you, that on the night in which Jesus was betrayed, took bread, and he broke it, and he said, this is my body, which is for you. And um, he, he broke the bread, but the strange thing of that analogy is that Jesus' body had no broken bones. Um, he was beaten beyond recognition, it seemed, from one of the Psalms, but his bones weren't broken, and uh, so bruised and all those things. But Paul takes us to this point here of instruction about the Lord's table and communion and Christ's death, that on the night in which he was betrayed, he took bread. And I want us to consider that thought there because uh, uh, this betrayal of Jesus uh, is interesting. Um, Jesus is the supreme ruler. He's, he's the savior, uh, but he's going to be betrayed. He's breaking heaven's supper with his disciples. He said to them in one of the passages, he says, I, I'm glad to have this time with you. And then he's going to go on from there. But in the Passover supper, Passover dinner that they're celebrating, he's going to give a new picture, a new covenant, picture of the new covenant in his blood. And it comes through the little piece of bread and the little cup of juice uh, that we drink in, in commemoration. And so the first thing I want us to know is that um, the betrayal of G uh, Jesus, uh, we, we understand, was by Judas, right? Everybody knows that story. Judas was the betrayer of Jesus. And, and so we're told that, that uh, you know, he had his hand in the dish and whatever, and there was something in the heart of Judas that he's they're all asking well who is it and he says the one with his hand in the dish with me and i make you wonder sometimes if jesus teased a little bit about things and judas has got his hand in the cup and he says it's not me lord and he says you've said it that's kind of strange but you know what stands out in my heart and you want to pay attention to your bible when you see this in matthew's account matthew 26 33 to 35 and there he says uh jesus says this night uh, the shepherd will be scattered, and all the, oh, the, the shepherd will, uh, the sheep will all scatter from the shepherd, and, uh, and, and you'll all deny me or whatever. And Peter gets all in a huff. He says, Jesus, I would never do that. I wouldn't do that even if I had to die. I will die for you. And the interesting part that people miss in that story, well, Peter's always kind of centered out and hyperactive, attention deficit type guy, whatever they seem to be, is that uh, the next verse says in verse 35, and so said all the other disciples. They said, no, we, we, we wouldn't deny you. Judas was tagged with the betrayal with a kiss in the garden. And Jesus is headed out to the garden. And he says this on the way. And Judah, Peter denies it vehemently. Not going to happen on my watch. Happened on his watch. But so did everyone else say. The betrayal before the communion service says the night Jesus was betrayed. God wants us to be mindful of the betrayal that goes on in our lives. We, we, we continue to betray Jesus in our lives, in our, in our actions. Our, when we sin, which means to miss the mark, we betray Jesus, in a sense. And, and, so, and then the devil takes that, any kind of little betrayal, oh, he wants to fan that, fan that into flames and whatever, and uh, destroy you and, and tear you down and what. But the um, idea and the betrayal is it happens whenever we just kind of do our own thing. When, when we say, um, we don't want to listen to what the Word of God says. We want to listen to our own thoughts and our motives and do whatever. We, you tell us forgive. Well, I can't forgive that. You tell us to, to love. Well, I, that, that person is unlovable. And, and you tell us to seek peace. Well, I don't want to have peace. It's, it's more fun to, uh, to rebel and do whatever. And that's the attitudes of people, and those are attitudes of betrayal. 
And Jesus reminds us at the communion table service, he says at the start of the service, on the night in which Jesus was betrayed. And it's like that situation is to make us mindful, to be careful of the things that we do. Betrayal of Jesus shows pride in our hearts, and God hates pride. If you want to see what pride does, go read Isaiah 14, where there's a picture of, um, uh, I think it's there, where it has the uh, betrayal of Nebuchadnezzar and this great king, and he's going to be so full of himself, he's going to be lifted up to the very stars of heaven. He says, I'll be like the Most High. Not greater, because he understands he can't be greater, but he's going to be lifted up. And he portrays in his life a picture of Satan and his work. The new, the new picture of the Passover has us turn focus on betrayal of Christ is possible even in our lives today as we do those things separate. And if you read 1 Corinthians, it carries on from there. He says, if you don't judge your body right and you take part, he says, you, you, you can get in trouble. He says, for this cause, many are weak and sickly among you, and people even sleep, which means die. And so it, it's a very serious thing to come and to uh, uh, act out in our worship and celebration of the, of the things that God has given us to do. Now, what I found was interesting, I've talked about this lots of times with my church, and it's kind of puzzled my own brain. I went looking into this message of the Hebrew part where the, where the bitter herb of the uh, Passover lamb uh, was involved. And what I found was really quite interesting. In Exodus chapter 12, I found some words, and this is what it says. It says, Speak to all the congregation of Israel, saying, uh, On the tenth of this month, each one shall take a lamb for themselves, according to their father's households, a lamb for each household. And then he goes down to verse 5, and he says, uh, he says Your lamb shall be an unblemished male of a, of a year old. You may take it from the sheep from the goat, or from the goats, and you shall keep it until the 14th day. And then in verse 6, he says, and you shall keep it until, oh, that's not the part, I don't need 6. Uh, keep it until the, okay, keep it until the 14th day, and then the uh, whole assembly of the congregation of Israel will, will kill it at twilight. So a lamb has to die and such, right? Now he goes on, verse 7, and he says, Moreover, uh, they shall take some of the blood and put it on the doorposts and on the lintel of the house in which they eat it. And uh, that's important things. We, we call this uh, activity there, which Easter is a celebration of the Passover. They, put, they killed the lamb, and it was a year old, special surgical qualifications for it, and they put blood over the door of their house. And the angel of the Lord was going to come by, and if he saw blood over the door, guess what? He didn't vi visit that house and bring death to the oldest child, uh, male child in that house. The lamb was a, was a, was a substitute for it. Being died. It had to be a male lamb and whatever, a year old, and when it was blood was over the door, that house was safe. You go read the story. You know the story of the prince of Egypt and such like, uh, how uh, God came in the land and even Pharaoh's son because there was no blood over the door. I like in that story that sometimes you see the, Israel, the Egyptians looking on at what's going on in Israel. Whatever they do, I'm going to do. And if they put blood over their door, their child didn't die, is my understanding of that story. But well, beloved, we, my friends, we see that here, um, as, as I looked into this passage here, uh, verse 8, it tells us these, th these thoughts, I want to just finish off with them. They shall eat the flesh that same night, roasted with fire, and they shall eat it with unleavened bread and with bitter herbs. The lamb had to be left intact and boiled, kind of over, a, cooked over a spit. You couldn't boil it because if you boiled it, it would fall apart and separate from its bones. They just seemed to have this lamb and uh, they, they cooked it up, roasted it up, whatever. And then they put it on the table there or however. And they cut their meat off and they enjoyed their meat, all that they could eat and whatever. Whatever was left over had to be burned. And this very meal is what Jesus and his disciples were celebrating, taking part in. It was the Passover and they were doing that. But they had to be eaten with bitter herbs. My Hebrew scholars pointed out this statement about the bitter herbs. The bitter herbs were not just a little add-on thing, a little, oh, add a little nice flavory taste. They were bitter herbs, some kind of a lettuce type program of plant that was kind of bitter and whatever. But, my friend, what I found was interesting was that it says, the Hebrew says, the, the, the bitter herb was an integral, it was the basis of the Passover meal. That they had to uh, be mindful of the bitterness. In Exodus chapter 1, uh, we're talking verse 12, Exodus chapter 1, 14 says, and it was, they had bitter treatment by the Egyptians with, their, with the uh, work that they had to do with the bricks. Find enough, you had to make the same number of bricks, but go find the sand and go find all those things. And it was a bitter treatment that they had. And God wants us to be mindful of the bitterness 
that we've been dragged out of, pulled out of when we have relationship with Jesus. He sets us free from the bondages of sin and hurt, degradation that we find, our, we find potential to, to be part of. He sets us uh, free from those things. But he says bitterness is the integral part of that meal. You had to eat the bitter? You eat some bitter? Okay, let's put some lamb in your mouth. Now, I'm not a big fan of lamb. You, know, you put lamb in your mouth and it takes away the bitter taste and moves it on. But you had to have the bitter. You know, somebody wrote a song one time. It says, I beg your pardon, but I never promised you a rose garden. Along with the sunshine, uh, you, you got to take the, the rain sometimes. And, and you know what? John 15, verse, 80, uh, verse 18 to 22 makes this statement. Jesus and he says, uh, um, here it is here, uh, 18 to 22, there it says, he says, if the world hates you, know that it hated me beforehand. This is Jesus talking. If you were of the world, the world would love its own. But because you are not of the world, uh, but I chose you out from the world, because of this, the world hates you. Remember the word that I said to you? Um, a slave is not greater than his master. If they persecuted me, they will persecute you. If they kept my word, they will keep your word also. But all these things uh, they will do to you for my name's sake, because they do not know the one who sent to me. And um, so uh, there we have uh, Jesus talking. Verse 20 says, If I had not come and spoken to them, they would not have sinned. But now they have no excuse for their sin. So he, he says there, they hated me. Guess what? They're going to hate you. Why? Because the Christian life is a life of separation from the wickedness of the world, separation from uh, the, the awful that's out there, the, the heart of man. He destroyed the world. Why? He says, because the heart of man was just, was just, the Lord looked and everything was just continually evil. And we're getting in the day in our world in which we live. Everything's continually evil. How evil can we make it? What can we do to make it evil? And uh, God wants us to be mindful of that. Bitterness is an integral part of our worship and coming to God. The bitterness and hurts of life, he's able to wash away and take away. He gives us 1 John 1 and 9, if we confess our sins, if we confess them, if we keep on confessing the Greek reads, if we continue to keep on confessing, he keeps on forgiving our sin. Why? There's a bitterness in our life. To the time we stand before God and we're holy and pure before Him, He wants us to know there's a bitterness going on that we have to deal with. And so we want to um, be mindful of that bitterness that's there. On the night in which Jesus was betrayed, it says, the remembrance of the Lord's table, the night in which He was betrayed, is the bitter herb. God wants man to be mindful. He is betrayed very, very often. I'm a pastor. I betray Jesus. You're whoever you are. You can be the greatest saint that you know. You betray Jesus. Arrogance is a great uh, betrayer. God doesn't like those things. He, uh, those are things that rob him of his glory that he should have in our lives. Betrayal is a bitter herb. Not to beat us down, but to make us mindful to keep ourselves refreshed in the blood of the Lamb, confessing our sin and coming to him. I trust this Easter season our hearts will be blessed as we consider the bitter herbs were the vital part of the Easter story. Thank you.